Hello, and thanks, Mina. Thank you as well. Glad to be here. Um, today, I wanted to, we want, Wayne and I wanted to kind of go over lots of fun things you're going to hear today. Um, we obviously wanted to talk about organizations have been dealing with growing amounts of data, really diverse data for some time, and there's no end in sight to that. Data is just going to continue to grow. So in this world of actually all this data, how do you discover really what's in your data to maximize your value? How do you extract insights and trends and meaning from all that data? Getting relevant data from big data or getting relevant information from big data like Hadoop really requires a different approach. If you're looking at reports or doing data discovery or turning out a couple of analytical models, it's really not going to cut it. What we need to do is look at advanced analytic algorithms. And there have been lots of advances in these algorithms, as well as analytical processing, such as in-memory analytics and in-database analytics, that has helped computations go faster. These techniques, such as predictive analytics, machine learning, and recommendation systems, have matured to support these processing that is needed for big data analytics. We also know that organizations are taking advantage of this advantage and using it to their competitive advantage. Um, they're also seeing that by using these types of in-memory analytics to discover patterns and reveal trends, they're able to use them faster and to their advantage for faster competitive advantage. Sorry, I was having a little problem with the slides. Anyway, this helps your organization redefine how to solve their complex problems. So in this session, we're going to discuss how to maximize your value from your data in Hadoop. Today, Wayne Thompson is going to demonstrate a few great things. He's going to interactively show you how to prepare, explore, and summarize your data. Because we all know that data summarization and getting that data in the right format to do modeling is key. Next, he's going to build classification and predictive models. As he does this, you're going to see how he can easily perform these tasks interactively and on the fly. Lastly, he's going to develop a product recommendation model. But before we get into that, I think Wayne wants to first describe the architecture that's needed for analytic Hadoop environment. Wayne? Well, thank you, Georgia. Um, would you go ahead and advance the slide? Thank you again, folks, for attending. Um, just from a housekeeping standpoint, what I'd like to discuss with you here is first of all some of the framework that we have for SAS and Hadoop co-locating on the Hadoop cluster to do really advanced multi-pass modern algorithms. I also want to emphasize too that um, SAS is uh, really uh, what's, is part of the Hadoop community. Uh, I'm going out to Santa Clara to go to Strata and I want to meet a lot of you while I'm out there. Hadoop is very important to our customers and of course is a very efficient way to store data and do so in a very parallel fashion to where you can really manage big data, not just big data, but complex data. But as I go through my demo, and I only have this one slide, what I want to emphasize to you is that we do everything inside of the Hadoop cluster. Hadoop is used to manage the data, to load the data into memory, and distribute it across a cluster. But SAS is also co-located, installed in the Hadoop cluster. And it doesn't matter whether it's Cloudera or Hortonworks, et cetera. But then once the data is lifted into memory, SAS takes over to do multi-pass calculations, to do the exploration, to do the predictive modeling, and also to do some machine learning. We don't use MapReduce in this case. We use our own threaded kernel instructions inside of the database and manage that across the cluster to get answers back almost instantaneously. So um, I just wanted to first go over that scenario and we'll cover a programming approach and also we'll cover uh, a UI approach to using a very flexible product called SAS Visual Statistics. Georgia, did you want to say one other thing or would you like me to get started with the demo? It'd be great if you could get started. Thanks. Okay, perfect. So let me go ahead and launch screen share and start sharing my desktop. And first of all, I want to show you how easy it is to develop models. And we could take a lot of different examples, but I happen to be inside of a product called Visual Statistics. And can you go ahead and 
and get a confirmation that you can see my desktop, folks. Georgia? Yep, I see it. Perfect, thank you. So in this example, um, what I'll start off is developing a supervised model. And I'll drag and drop, I already have the data loaded, and over to the left to have all my variables. And I'll set up and explain the problem to you as we go through it. But, you know, uh, this is uh, for a donation for a charitable organization. And it's actually the Paralyzed Veterans Administration. So I have a response variable that's continuous, a measure called donation amount. Now this model also would work if you were looking at, for example, some kind of expenditure, like purchase propensity at a retail store. Or in a manufacturing process, it could be some continuous measure, like the thickness or strength of metal. Um, it could also be um, in, in like fraud, like the actual amount that was fraudulent. So this is a continuous target. And you can see here that these donations are, are relatively small. They start out at like a dollar, and we have a few over here to the right. This data, by the way, was used in a KDD competition. But what I did is blow it up a little bit just for analysis. If we look here at the actual data source details, we can see that we have 1.5 million observations. Now, the data itself is it's not humongous, but Really, it's the complexity, not the size of the data that really matters. And we'll analyze and look at some larger data as well. Now, one of the things I may want to do is say, well, what other variables, what other inputs might be correlated or associated with this donation amount? So what I can do is just grab some of these variables, like home value, income, things like amount of purchase, gift range, and so forth. Um, I might also want to look at whether or not they were in the military. And then we have some other, other things, too, like uh, PEPSTAR, which is kind of a status for previous donors, like gold and bronze and so forth. And again, what's so powerful about this is I can do auto charting. I just drag and drop it to the desktop. And let me go ahead and maximize this so you can see a little bit better. And what happens here, too, is Again, this is very fast and furious. What I'm doing is working on the fly, just by being able to drag and drop these data onto the desktop and first of all look at histograms. And now I have a correlation matrix. And here's my predictor variable that I'm interested in, donation amount. And you can see some things like the gift, gift amount in the past is, is fairly strongly correlated with this. Although we have some other things that are fairly weak. And I could do lots more exploratory analysis. You can see I have lots of tools here, like doing contingency tables. And I could fit things like the correlation matrix that you see here. And even if I have textual data and stuff, I can do stuff like bring it in and develop word clouds and so forth. But for this example, what I'd like to do is go ahead and see if I can express this particular correlation matrix and express this donation amount as a function of these other variables as a predictive model. So what I'm going to do is highlight this row. And then I can automatically develop a predictive model by going over here and saying extended features. And this will automatically develop me a regression model, just like that. Very easy, very interactive. And just about anyone could do it. And think about how easily I'm managing and working with the data in do. Now, it's building me a regression model. Hi, Wayne. Are you still with us? Yeah. Okay. Back to you then. We'll silent for just a moment. Back to you. Let me go ahead and try something here real quick. I'm going to go back over here and let me log in to this environment, show you very quickly how this works from scratch. So I'm going to log in to my environment. I want to select my data. And I'm going to go ahead and develop a model. And we'll go ahead and load this data from Hadoop again. And the data I'd like to load is this Paralyzed Veterans Administration data. 
And so I'll bring this up. And remember, what I was trying to do is model this variable called donation amount. And I already have a linear regression. And I'll just select a few of these variables again and see how we do. So again, I'll pick up some things like the home value and home income, and also some things like gift amounts. And we talked about that star rating. You know, I can grab a few of these variables, you know, that I feel like might be of interest and drag and drop them onto the desktop. And that will automatically set up and develop the regression model for me. And there we have it. So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time just talking about the value and interactivity of this model and explain a few things. Now, we'll go over each one of these panels momentarily, but you can see that I have donation amount expressed as a response. And then we had also saw that I did the correlation matrix earlier, so now this is actually a regression model. And if I want to take other variables and just drag them onto the a model and, and add them as effects into the model, like gender, I just drag and drop it. So now I've gone from adding not only continuous effects, but also classification effects into the model. So very quickly, again, the data is loaded into memory. I only read it one time. And then the computations are done across the grid, and I can work very interactively in an exploratory manner. If I want to take a couple other variables, again, drag and drop them, no problem. And this allows me, again, to kind of look and find variables that might be of interest in my model. Let's say I want to take one of these variables, like wealth rating. Or let's just take two of these here and just create an interaction. So I can create an interaction between those two terms. And as you can see, I can drag and drop and add an interaction effect to my model. So the key that I want to emphasize here is that I'm developing the model interactively. The data is only loaded once into memory. And then we repetitively do the analytics on it without reading it back to disk. We're not using MapReduce. And again, SAS is running inside of a Hadoop co-located with the data. Now let's look at a couple other things and just explain a little bit of the output first. So you saw me develop my regression model, and, and I've got quite a few things here. The first thing I see that is I get some nice variable importance. So you can see, actually, most of the variables, with the exception of that interaction I developed, um, are important. You know, they have significance into the model. So that's very nice. And you can actually change this if you wanted to change the thresholds and things from a visual perspective. The other thing you can do is a lot of people are old school. You know, they like to have their statistical output. So you can see that we have the overall ANOVA indicating that my model is significant and that we're explaining 34.25% of the overall variability and donation amount by using these effects in my model. And in addition, we get things like parameter estimates, standard errors, and so forth. So you get all of that statistical output that you would expect. Let me go ahead and hide that and show you a few more things. Another thing that you can do is that here we have the model assessment. A lot of people like to look at this. So on the vertical axis, you can see that I have the donation amount. And again, what I want to do is look at this donation amount across these various bins. And let me describe that. First of all, the actual predicted amount is what, what you see here in blue. So you can see here that if you look at a depth of 10, the top, the, the, the average predicted amount here is um, 23.245, whereas the actual observed amount is 28.56. And what we do is we bend this data into deciles, where actually we have 20 bins, one for each of the five percentiles. So there's 20 bins here. So you can look across the data. For example, here at the 40th percentile, my model is predicting that the average predicted amount is 17, whereas the actual amount is 18. But overall, the model is doing pretty good. It's kind of um, underestimating here and overestimating towards the end. But this is nice in the terms of not just looking at statistics in terms of like the R square or the uh, root mean squared error. But I can also look at assessment statistics and get those on the fly. Very powerful. The other thing I like to do, too, is look at residual diagnostics. Let me explain that to you momentarily. So when I do a prediction, we talk about my actual versus my predicted. 
And the difference between those, if they're the same, would be zero. So the difference between the actual and the predicted amount represents a residual. And normally you would see if there was no error, there would be very little error. You wouldn't expect that from a predictive model, but in this case, you'd have a lot of values around zero, and you see that here. But we also see that I'm missing some values, you know, that my model, that it's not doing that well in this case, where we have some very large residuals. Now, first of all, let me explain that we had about 1.5 million observations. So not only is it hard to perhaps use other tools that have to write things back down to disk and do interactive analysis, as I've shown here, but in this case, we have also have a lot of data. And the ability to visualize very large data is sometimes difficult. So what we do is this is, again, a heat map of the residual. And again, you want to look for a random kind of shotgun pattern of the data distributed across the row. And I have, again, as I said, I've got some extremities up here. I definitely got some extremities down here. I might want to work on my model some more. And, you know, I'm not so concerned about standard assumptions like normality and independence and so forth, but I can look here at how the data is distributed in terms of the residual. And I can do some other things, too, just by on the fly. I can also plot this and say, well, what do these residuals look like across, let's say, some socioeconomic cluster codes? And this represents a box plot. So I can see for each of these clusters, this is typically overlay data, perhaps, that you would buy when you get ready to develop your model and you want to target a campaign for future customers. You may also want to look at some of these socioeconomic cluster codes that you might add or augment to your data stored in a do. And you can see that really um, the, red, the solid line represents the mean, and the box itself contains 75% of the data. And the diamond represents the median. And you can see in this one cluster code with the question, the data is quite skewed. The median is much larger than the mean. And that's true for all the others. But in general, I see roughly about the same spread. And again, the ability to slice and dice and look at this data in so many different ways. I can look at it across wealth rates without ever dropping the data back down to disk. And I think that that is just really cool to work interactively. And I'm not having to learn how to program. I know some of you want to write code, and we'll address that momentarily. But it is very easy to develop, to develop these models. Let me show you something else cool. Let's say that I wanted to take these observations this band of observations of residual. And let me go ahead and minimize this so you can see a little bit better. I want to take this band of observations, and just like I did before, where I added model effects interactively and excluded model effects, I can do the same thing with observations. Folks, just like that, I excluded those residuals and refit the model, and again, you know, if we're looking at here at the observation count, it's right at 387,000. And that's because we had a lot of people that didn't make a donation. So the 1.5 went down to 387,000. But that's still pretty incredible to fit that model that quickly. And if I come back here and just say remove that exclusion, of course I can do that. You need to be careful, you know, just taking out outliers and so forth. But you can see how they're affecting your model. And if you want to keep them in, no problem. And again, the ability to just check and, and kind of work the way that my mind thinks, and that is, again, very interactively. So if I come back here, I want to show you one more thing before we go to some of the programming. And again, thanks, guys, for joining today. I really didn't want to show a lot of slides. I want to continue focusing on how you analyze the data and look at it. And we'll address the programming approach in just one moment, but the last thing I have is see, I've developed this model again. I've got a decent fitting model. Maybe I want to add a few effects and tune it some more. But let's say I want to develop models by group bys, separate categories. So we have that cluster code. What if I want to assign that variable as a group by variable? Again, what will happen is out on the grid across this cluster I have, it will build all of these models concurrently almost as fast as I can select it and bring the results back. This doesn't matter in this case where I have five groups. Okay, These are my various clusters here, and these are the thumbnails. So this is the cluster code four. And if I select this cluster code two, notice all of my charts update. Those are the residuals here for that cluster two. 
notice that my uh, assessment plot looking at the average versus the observed plot across the death of file, the deciles, is looking very good. They're almost virtually the same. And I can also look at this cluster number three, and I can kind of just go through, kind of leaf through my analysis for these various group buys and see how my model's doing. And again, this is almost like a model factory, if you would. You know, I can, I can do this for hundreds of buy groups. And again, we're smart enough in terms of how the data is allocated across the grid by Hadoop and how the SAS process takes over and crunches and computes a regression model across each of those nodes and brings the results back to the client. Very easy to do. The other thing I can do is I can look at a particular variable, like this pet star, whether or not you have certain status within club membership within this charitable donation. And you can see that this pet star variable is very important for cluster number one, whereas it's not very important for this socioeconomic cluster number three. So I have these things, too, that I can look at the data and just see how the variable importance and so forth goes. I can have more than one group by. Now, we've looked at just one algorithm, and I don't have time to show you a lot of the others, but we have logistic regression, and we have generalized linear models. We have decision trees. We're having random force come soon in another release. Uh, we have the integrated model comparison, plus we have k-means clustering algorithms. So this thing is called SAS Visual Statistics. It's very easy to use. I don't want to get too producty, but what I want to do is show you that, yes, it is important to do interactive analysis. Hadoop provides the right framework for managing and sourcing the data. And in this case, SAS provides the analytics. So let's switch gears. How about that? Let's, let's say I don't like to clickety-click. What I want to do is I roll code. I'm a data scientist, and this all looks pretty and so forth, but I like to write code. Well, in this case, we have another product called SAS in-memory statistics for Hadoop. And I'm going to log in, just like I did before, via a browser-based product. And uh, let me go ahead and get that. Hang on just a moment. Now, let me explain this to you just to, just for a moment. Um, this is a web browser-based programming environment. So this is SAS Studio. And you can see over on the left, I have folders to my tables and my data sets and so forth. And then I have my programs in the middle, and we're going to run those. But you know, this is kind of just like we saw with SAS Visual Statistics. I have you know anywhere, anytime type analytics for my browser. And as before, um, I have Hadoop installed with SAS co-located on the cluster. And this is called SAS in-memory statistics for Hadoop. This is coming out later this year, um, in March, in fact, of this year, and is a dedicated analytical product for modeling in Hadoop using SAS. So what I'm going to do is I've already got some programs up here. And I'm going to run, go over this particular one. Let me just do a little organizational work here. Let me maximize this view. And because, um, just like before, when I was working with the SAS visual statistics, what I want to do is I want to go interactive, radio interactive here. And so I'm going to set this into interactive mode. And then I have a statement here that basically has some connectivity parameters and options for connecting to the cluster. And at that point, I'm going to load some data. I have some detailed data about automobiles from an auction. And then I have more of a dimension table called car info. And we'll set up the business problem as we go through the analysis. But I'm reading the data from Hadoop into memory. And let me go ahead and submit this. So again, the data is stored in Hadoop. And I'm using PROC Laser and laser analytics with SAS in-memory statistics for Hadoop, first of all, to load the data uh, into memory. And then after that, you know, I'm going to kind of walk through this as a data scientist would.
Okay? So let's think about this. I'm going to address this as I would many analysis. I see that, first of all, I have a cluster, and I have 16 com compute nodes on it. Um, what I'll do is just, I'll just type this code to show you some of the self-directed help that you get from SAS Studio. So proc data set data equals, actually I'm going to do a live equals, live equals, and then I'm going to do a library to that particular library reference that points to the data I loaded from Hadoop into memory, and I'm going to issue a quit. And so the first thing as a data scientist, I just want to know, well, what data do I have out there to work with? Do I have the right data to analyze? And you can see it comes back very quickly. If I scroll down here, and what I'm going to do too is just increase the size a little bit more to make sure you can see some of this. But you can see that I have this car data, and like you saw before with the veterans data, I have about a million observations. So we're going to just crank and develop a few models on a million observations. And then I have some dimension data, and I want to save space and store some of this redundant data called car info into a dimension table. But you can see I have 2,791 observations for that. Now, this is really the rock, the bread and butter for this underlying product, and it is called PROC MSTAT. That stands for in-memory statistics. And what happens is when I start this procedure, like the data, it stays up in memory, and then I just start working against it, learning about the data, doing data summarization, building models, dragging and dropping terms, just like I was in visual statistics, but I'm writing the code. So what I'm going to do is, well, let's see what kind of server I have. And then again, I can also get table info from PROC MSTATS if I didn't want to use something like PROC dataset. So I'm going to submit that. And again, I'm in interactive mode. And there you go. So remember when I had that discussion about my analytical framework with the slides? I have this grid that has 16 worker nodes. I have a communication node that handles communication between these general nodes. And here's the various generals. Keep in mind, it's not MapReduce. We're using SAS here in memory within the Hadoop. And these are the nodes that are going to do the computation. And unlike MapReduce, these nodes communicate between one another. This is especially important when you're dealing with large dimensionality data and building design matrices and then doing multipass analytics, like doing something like a gradient descent on some kind of supervised modeling method. So I see I have this data. I have this environment that I want to work with. Now let's just go ahead and look a little bit more at the data. So here I want to describe to you a little bit about the problem. OK. So uh, let's say I work at a car auction. And for this particular data, what I want to do is predict whether or not I have a bad car. It is called a kick car in the industry at an auction. It is very expensive to buy these cars and for them to be lemons. You pay shipping costs. You pay freight. You have to fix the cars. So Maybe I want to have a predictive model that helps me look at these cars prior to the auction and classify whether or not they're a good buy. This is a dichotomous response, a binary target. Remember when I was modeling the PVA data, the veterans data, I was looking at a continuous target. So here we're going to build a classification supervised model. And we have a million rows, as I indicated up here. And then we have some variables that we're going to use to do the predictive modeling with. These are the explanatory inputs. Then we have things like the odometer, price information about the vehicles, the buyer number, whether or not it was an online purchase or not. And then we have some detailed information that we'll join here with this car info dimension table. But first, I want to do some exploratory analysis. The other thing I always advise before you fit any data, it's very important not, not only just to do some summaries and so forth, they actually take a peek at the data and look at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to look at the first five observations using this table statement and fetch the first five observations. I'm going to format that nicely. Now, if you look at what I'm doing, by the way, what am I doing? I'm running MSTAT. Notice that the data is loaded in memory. I am not 
dropping it back down to disk. And what I'm able to do is just submit these actions, these laser actions, and learn about the data interactively. And as you can see, things are coming back to me almost instantaneous. So we have an indication here. We have uh, is bad buy and these first four five observations. We can see we have an indicator of good. Uh, the event level that we'll see later is bad, B-A-D. And we have some more data, information about the data. And we can scroll over here and see some of the output and so forth. But everything looks good. This is the kind of data I would expect. But before I build my model, the other thing I like to know is, well, what about the cardinality of the data? Again, I'm just learning about the data, getting my hands dirty before I build a model. And so I'm going to run a table statement, and I'm going to run a distinct. And this is very impressive to me. If I submit this, I'm going to get distinct counts for all the variables in the data set. Now, I want to come here and look at this log and show you how fast that happened again on one over a million observations. If I look down here and scroll down to this log, I ran this distinct and it happened in 3.26 seconds. Very impressive. And what did I get? Again, if you look here, I can see how many values I have for the data. And that's important, too, because I want to know maybe how to treat you know, whether or not uh, a variable is continuous. I may want to take a variable and consider whether or not I want to use that class effect in the model. If I get too many levels, you know, um, sometimes that kind of can inflate my model, provide spur per spurious, spurious splits, if you would, for a decision tree. The other thing is if I'm modeling a binary dichotomous target, I want to make sure I have just two distinct values here, which I do. So we have that, and again, it did those distinct counts for me very quickly across these variables. We can see it's like the average price and things we would expect uh, those kinds of values. The next thing I want to do is, well, you know, I expect the bad buys, I expect the bad cars to be somewhat of a rare event. So I'm going to do a frequency and look at the occurrence of bad to good buys in this historical data. And you've got to have historical data, by the way, to do predictive modeling. You've got to have known outcomes for each of the responses so that you can develop the model and then apply the scoring logic to new data. And here we have bad and good, and we can see our ratio is right about, that's about 15%. So I've actually done some oversampling in my Hadoop environment. I could do it here in SAS as well, but I have about a 15% bad rate that I have here in my model. And sometimes that's important too. Again, it's not the size that matters, it's the complexity of the data. When you're looking at rare events, lots of the times these algorithms do a little bit better by getting a good representation of the event level that you're modeling, in this case, bad. Now, let me show you, again, the power of this language. And th this is really just SAS. Um, if you look, what I like to do next is, as I'm analyzing this data, what we're doing is, rather than write it back to disk, we're creating these temp tables. And we can add new columns to these temp tables on the fly. So one thing I may want to do is create a variable called vehicle age and another one that is the average odometer reading. And the way I do that is simply assign this expression. And I'm going to run a summary action to get summaries on these variables once I create them. So I'm going to create these new variables, and I'm using this expression here. I'm taking the year function, because you can run SAS code inside of this mstat logic, and I'm extracting the, the year, and then I'm adding plus one to the vehicle year and get my vehicle age. Obviously, the odometer reading, in this case, if I want to look at the average, I take what's on the odometer divided by the year. And that computes it. But in addition, remember when I did my visual statistics analysis, we did a nice group by on a variable called so social economic cluster code, and I developed those separate models. Well, here's an example where I compute these temporary variables. I want to do a summary, and I also want to do a summary by not only the target variable, is bad by, but vehicle age. So let me let this rip. Yep, and I want to make sure that my run statement is here. And what I'm going to do is I've decided to look at just some of the older vehicles in my analysis. So this where says, select these vehicles that are 8, 9, and 10 years old. 
very easy to write. You know, I work with a lot of data scientists. You know, I think that, you know, this is the way you, you work and express. But the, the language and, and, and the ability to get back this information is just very easy, very simple to look at and evaluate. And here you can see that I have my analysis output just like that. You know, just like you saw my distinct, as fast as I can submit it, as fast as I get the results back. So there is bad and average odometer reading. So if you look here at the average for cars that are eight years old, we can see that the odometer is a little higher than it is for good cars that are eight years old. We see the same kind of trend for bad cars that are not nine years of age, we can see that the average odometer is a little higher than it is for good cars that are of the same age. And we see the same kind of trend here. So that's kind of one pattern I noticed. Let me see if I see that same kind of pattern in some of the newer cars. So I'm going to actually compare that for vehicles of two, three, four years as well. So I'm just going to resubmit this code and do the computation for that as well. Really easy to use, and if I scroll back over here, let's do a control plus just to help you out see that. And scroll down. If we look at vehicles that are of two, age two, um, the average is 25, whereas for good cars it's 26. So the, the it's kind of reversed here. It looks like for some of the newer cars, the odometer reading is actually less for bad cars. So that's one thing I've discovered here, just by doing some summary analysis and computing some of these variables on the fly. The next thing I might want to do is say, well, I really like those variables. Um, what I like to do is write these out to the table as permanent variables, and then I can use them. And by the way, I can promote this table into memory so that other people can use it. So it's not just kind of a silo. This is set up for multi-users to really a pod of data scientists to work concurrently and get the most out of the cluster that they've invested in. So I'm going to create a new table. Actually, I'm going to write these columns to the same car data set that I have, that same detailed data. But now what I'm doing is I'm actually using a score action to create these new columns. Typically, we think of scoring as being able to write out new predictions and so forth. But we can also use this score action to do data management, to do new column computation. So if you look at this program I'm calling here from this file name statement, and I'll go over here and look at that, I'm actually creating those same variables where I'm creating average, average age, and I have this assignment statement to create that, and again, using the year function. And I also have this ratio to create the average age. And then I also decided I'd like to create an interaction called PUAG. And I'm simply taking two variables and concatenating them and then putting them together to form this interaction. And that is the interaction of prime unit by the um, auction guarantee variable. So what I can go over here is I've found some variables that are inter interest. And now what I want to do is go ahead and create those as permanent variables. So let me scroll down here, and I'm going to go ahead and get some column info on them, and I'm also going to do some summary analysis. If we look at my log as this is running, again, as fast as I can look at it, it's already come back with the results. You know, I tried to look at the log, see if it was running, and here it is. So you can see that down at the bottom of my output, you know, I have all this information. There's that new interaction term that I created and the different levels for the interaction of those two categorical variables and the frequency associated with them. And then there's the permanent variable for average odometer reading where I ran a summary on it. So let's go ahead. Let's say now I've got some clean data. I've done some summarization. I created a few new attributes I may want to evaluate in my model. So now I'm going to take and join in the model key information from this dimension table called car info. So this schema allows me to join the tables together. And um, after I join the tables, what I'm going to do is go ahead and, and promote that laser table. And then 
there's one variable that had a few nulls in it, and when you do something like a logistic regression, it does complete case analysis. This one just had a handful of them, so I'm just going to strip those out. I'm really not too concerned about it. So let me go ahead and run that, and then uh, I'm going to get some column info. So I'm merging back the data, and I'm creating what's called a flattened out analytical table where I'm using the model key, where I have one row per subject. And in this case, the model key is my ID variable that I'm going to use for modeling. And again, I have that binary target is bad by, and all of these other candidate predictor variables I'm going to use to model them. So you can see the output. And I've seen you, you've seen some of this already. It's just now we've gone from a temp table to getting all this assembled with the detailed and the dimension table. Let's build some models. So if I go over here now and look at this statement, now I have a macro variable. And when I write models and stuff, what I like to do is put the candidate variables into a macro or a list. So I don't have to type them out every time I build a model. So this first list represents my categorical variables, my candidate categorical variables, like whether or not it was an online sale, the interaction of these two variables, uh, the wheel type, even a variable that has a lot of dimensionality to it, like the color, or the auction where the vehicle was bought. And then I have my continuous predictors going into this list too. And then my response. Now, one of the things I like to do first, and logistic regression does a really nice job. We fit a, re a regression before for the continuous target, but here I'm going to fit a logistic. And then what happens is my target and my predictors get resolved with these macro variables, and then we actually write the score code out as SAS score code. And that gets written out to this file that I can apply to new data. Well, let's just check out how fast this logistic regression runs. Again, this is a multi-pass algorithm, unlike the uh, model that I ran before with the linear regression. And just like that, it is done. If I scroll down here and look at the table, let's see. Got one apparent symbol resolution here. And what I need to do is I forgot to set my macro variables. So let's go ahead and rerun that. So you also get some indication if something went wrong. You can see whether or not you have errors. You get nice grammar files back to let you know that something happened. And so what I want to do is first submit this macro that assigns you know, the list and then populates my model statement as part of my logistic action. So now we're good to go. Um, let's see how we're doing here again. So this is the way one would do this. And if you look down here at the bottom, we actually ran our logistic, and that completed in 8.2 seconds on this data. There's a lot of information here that we're not going to be able to go in great detail about our logis logistic regression model. But um, just for kicks, I'll look through the data, no pun intended. And you can see, first of all, you get your ordered information. And notice the event that I'm modeling is whether or not a car is a bad buy. So the event level is bad. And then you get information about the dimensionality of the uh, design matrix, like the X, the number of classification variables you had. Again, I'm looking at just over a million observations. You get summary statistics, like Akaiki's information criteria that look at penalties, functions, and whether you've perhaps added too many parameter estimates. Um, I have a fairly low R square here, but this is real data and it's very hard to predict. This is the real world, world, folks, and predicting whether or not a car is going to be kicked in an auction is a very difficult thing to do, but we're doing much better than at random. And you can see that we have our parameter estimates here as well, just like we had in visual statistics that a lot of statisticians want to look at. They want to look at each of these parameter estimates and the standard errors associated with them along with the probabilities. One issue, though, is with big data, typically you are going to get a lot of significance just by nature due to the observational count. These um, p-values are a function of the observation value. And if you have lots of data, just everything's going to be significant in your model. So one thing you want to do, too, is run some assessment, just like we did in visual statistics. So I'm going to run this assessment action. And I'm going to use an inverse link function to take and, 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 and put this, these, this vector of betas together as a series of probabilities. And 
my event, of course, is bad. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these into 10 bins, and I'm going to output from this assessment some ROC tables and lift tables and things like that so I can plot them later. I'd like to go into more detail. I've got a lot of stuff here to show you, but I'm basically computing assessment statistics like lift, like uh, receiver operator curve measures and C statistics and so forth, so I can get an idea of how well my model's doing in terms of false positives and true negatives and things also like the KS statistic and the accuracy or the uh, ac the actual accuracy of the model and lots of other statistics. And then up at the top, we can see that we have all my list statistics that I got from the first where I can look at, you know, the percent captured across the various deciles, cumulative lifts, and so forth. And it looks like my model overall is doing pretty good at the various depths of file. You know, we can see that. You know, the lift is uh, pretty good, especially here in the uh, first decile. So let's try a few other things. Um, what I'd like to do is, I think I'll skip this decision tree, but we do uh, classification trees. And um, I think I'm just going to go ahead at this point and run a random forest. So a lot of times people like to run ensembles of models. And the random forest allows us to build lots of decision trees. I think what I'm going to do is build 20 here instead of just 10. So I'm going to build 20 trees. And what happens with the random forest is during the construction of each of these trees, it's going to randomly swap in variables. And I'm going to swap in six at each split point, And that allows us to kind of randomly permute the variables across these 20 trees in hopes of taking a lot of weak learners and getting a stronger classifier by ensembling them together. The other thing, too, is not only are you going to swap in and out variables, but I'm also going to swap in and out data. I'm going to build each tree on 70%, but I'm going to perturb that 70% each time I build a tree. And I'm going to hold out the other 30% called an out-of-bag estimate to try to get estimates of how well the tree generalizes. And you can see I have some other statistics here as well. Notice I'm using the same variables that I've populated into my um, logistic regression. And I'm writing out the score code. This is the secret sauce that you could then uh, can apply and run in a dupe if you'd like and do scoring to where you can generate probabilities of future cars at the auction. And so let me just let this rip tater chip and see how it's doing. So I'm growing, again, 20 decision trees. It's called random woods because we typically also grow these trees at a very deep level. And um, let's see how fast we ran 20 trees here in this particular model at 12.2 seconds. So amazing. Very fast. I can also, we tend to try you know, maybe a couple thousand trees even to get better, better model fit and so forth. But you can see here that um, that gives me a summary of my random woods algorithm. I get variable importance to understand, well, what variables are really making up these trees. There's my out-of-bag error so that I can get an estimate how, how well the model's fitting, because these random wood models are random forest tend to um, can, can overestimate the training error. So you want to look at that out-of-bag estimate. The last thing I'm doing here, too, and I know we have just about four more minutes, is I'd like to go ahead and generate some summary graphics that look at things like lift charts and so forth. If you look back up here when I fit my uh, logistic regression model, um, what I did is I output some of these um, ROC information and lift information from this subsequent assessment action. So what I'd like to do is rather than just look at tables and so forth, we generate a lot of tables, and this is done for speed within the product. But um, I'm going to go ahead and issue a quit statement, too, which shuts down my in-memory statistics session. Remember, it was active, interactive, and up and running the whole time. And now I'm going to generate the plots. And while this is running, um, I just want to say that we've really looked at two different ways here. Um, one, a very quick, easy to use drag and drop interface, and uh, a quick way to look at getting models and develop them on the fly, and being able to look at variable importance. And 
even look all the way down to the observational level to see, you know, what's going on with the models and so forth. And let me just drop this deck down a little bit in size, but now you can see, for example, I have my lift chart, uh, there's my ROC chart, and if I scroll up a little bit more, there's my lift chart to the right, and um, now I've controlled minus too much, so let me bring that back up. Excuse me, folks. Hi, Wayne. Yes. Hi there. All right. So, um, yeah, I, th I think at this point I'm done, and um, I appreciate the time. We've gone through both, uh, both methodologies for developing the models using the respective products, and thanks for your time. Okay, and with that, folks, we're going to say a really big thank you to Wayne and Georgia and see if we can um, address some questions here. Georgia, are you ready to take some questions, or did you have a couple more slides you wanted to talk about? We did have a few more slides that we wanted to go over. Okay, back to you. Okay, sorry. So thanks, everyone, for your attention. Um, that was a great demo, Wayne. Um, as you saw, Wayne showed you lots of ways to analyze your data using in-memory analytic solutions over the entire analytical lifecycle, from preparing your data to exploring it to modeling it and then deploying it. So I just wanted to briefly tell you a little bit about the products. I think Wayne did a good job, so I'm going to just kind of go through this quickly. But you saw visual statistics is the beautiful GUI interface, the one that actually provides the highly interactive visual and multi-user environment to help you create analytical models. Then you saw SAS in-memory statistics for Hadoop. And we, that was created mainly because we know people still want to go out there and, you know, code and have that flexibility. So this is geared more toward the data scientists and programmers who are introducing to who are interested in making sure that they can customize their analysis the way they want. So the next thing is, what is about, you know, what kind of value can you get from your in-memory analytics? Well, we wanted to just kind of highlight a few things that kind of Wayne talked to you about. One, it's very accurate. You can leverage the most proven state-of-the-art analytical algorithms and machine learning techniques to get the best business results. It's also very scalable, and I think this is key. A lot of technologies out there cannot do this, but as your data grows, your users grow, and your data becomes, and your business problems become more complex, we can scale with you. Lastly, this is a very productive um, environment that you both saw. Um, both of them allow multiple users to interact with the data at the same time, and I think it's because mainly that data is being held in memory throughout the entire analysis, and that is allowing for a significant reduction in data latency. So we're going to start for Q&A, but I wanted to also um, tell you we have some additional resources if you want some more information. We have a TDWI best um, practices paper on big data, on managing big data. We also have a link to our site about more about what we offer from a Hadoop's perspective. And you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. So now I think, Yasmina, it's time for Q&A if you have a few. Sure. And we have lots and lots of questions that have come in. So folks, if you do have a question for Georgia and Wayne and what, what they've been talking to you about and showing you, please open that group chat widget. If you hadn't opened it yet, type it in, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. All right. So we've got uh, several questions here, and we'll just take them in the order they came in. Um, AJ Sanchez would like to know, if you are looking for patterns, why not do clustering analysis? We have several clustering methods available in this tool, um, k-means, db-scan, etc., and also allow you segment data by decision tree. The topics are not covered by the talk today. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, really, the uh, SAS in-memory statistics for Hadoop is such a deep product. so. You know, in addition to the supervised methods, it does provide, you know, clustering techniques like k-means and db scans so that you can perhaps first develop segments and then you could even use those segments as group buys and develop separate models in each group and that's called stratified modeling. Um, again, because of time, we couldn't go over all those things. In addition, you know, we have the ability to do text parsing and to bring in the underlying textual data with the structured information and commingle that to do enhanced predictive modeling. So there's a full set of text parsing. And then unfortunately, I had so much to show you as well today, I didn't go through all the recommendation engine and so forth, but we have 
you know, KNN and matrix factorization ensembles for that to develop both implicit and explicit recommendations. So it's pretty full featured, and maybe next time we'll do some of the clustering for you. Great, thank you, Wayne. Uh, another question here, this one's from Nick. How does visual statistics differ from your visual analytics tool? Same thing, new name? Uh, that's a great question. So visual statistics really adds, you know, a lot more control over developing the models and includes additional methods like generalized linear models and you have great control over the distribution and error functions. It also adds interactive decision trees and a lot more options for tuning the trees such as, you know, defining the splitting criteria and setting tree depth and so forth. And um, it also includes um, the clustering, which is uh, presently not part of the visual analytics. What's more important is that they go together very tightly. Um, they are used in tandem, and actually visual analytics is a component of visual statistics. And we know that you have to do the exploratory analysis, not only on the front end before you develop models, but on the back end to understand how customer cases are scored. So when you license visual statistics this March, when it comes out, we hope you see value in it, give it a try. That will include visual analytics. They work together like bread and butter. Okay, thank you very much. And we do have a few more questions that are coming in. Um, Sanjay would like to know, is SAS available as um, software as a service model as well? Georgia, you want to take that one? Yes, we actually have quite a few offerings that are software as a service. Um, we, we can talk about it if we're actually going to have this available um, in the near future. But um, if you're interested in that, definitely you can look at our website under our on-demand solutions and software as a service. And we also have a very large cloud initiative underway, and you can check that on our website. And, um, you know, we've been doing software as a service for quite some time, and we also have a, an expert team that does uh, hosting and lots of experience, over 100 PhD statisticians involved in, in helping develop and do consulting work. So yes and yes, as Georgia said. Great, thank you. Another question here, are these products, visual statistics and in-memory statistics for Hadoop, potential replacement for SAS Enterprise Miner? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, folks, I was the Enterprise Miner product manager for over a decade. and. One of the big differences you can see here is, first of all, um, visual statistics is a drag and drop kind of turn on the dime, smoke the tires kind of exploratory tool. Enterprise Miner is more of a process flow, drag and drop, batch driven application. There are some overlaps in the algorithms. Um, visual statistics does generate SAS code, so you can do integrated model comparison in Enterprise Miner, so they work in tandem. And in terms of the SAS in memory for statistics, I cannot emphasize to you how important Hadoop is to SAS, how important Hadoop is to SAS customers. And so this is targeted very much as a new programming interface for customers who want to leverage big data in Hadoop and use SAS to solve problems. Great, thank you. We have a question here from Kevin. You used millions or couples in your demo. Real big data is in billions. How does SAS, Viz, or InMem handle the case you don't fit in mem? Yeah, so that's a good question. So in my demo, and again, I really feel like too that you know the number of rows, first of all, is not so much important in machine learning and statistics. It's a function of the columns. You know, so anytime, for example, you have a categorical variable, if you have a hundred levels, you're going to create 99 new columns to you know, creating the design matrix. And if many of those, it's really the width of the data that matters. Um, we did a demo at our Analytics 2014 conference out in Orlando, and we ran that on stage with 70 million observations. And you can expect to see very much the same kind of results almost instantaneous. The other thing is, you know, with these in-memory tools, there's definitely a sizing exercise involved. Uh, 
uh, a statistician or a group of statisticians can do a lot of work very quickly with this type of analysis and build lots of temp tables and draw heavily from the cluster. So we work closely with you to do sizing, and we also do some caching back to disk when needed. So we'll drop things down when we're running out of memory and do some work on disk. But, um, you know, the, the memory's cheap. Um, the environments are getting less expensive. And so we think this is a good model for customers going forward. Great. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, next question here. Jenny would like to know, what data set being used that you're using, and is it available anywhere for download? Um, yeah, actually these tables are, um, but not in the form that I, I showed them. I blew them up. Um, I like my friends at Kaggle. I participate in some Kaggle competitions once in a while. I'd like to, to do better. I just don't have as much time as I'd like to do it. But they had this kicker data where you actually evaluate some of these uh, bad buy cars. You can log into Kaggle and get you an account, download it. And I think it's, you know, much smaller, but uh, that's there. And then this paralyzed veterans data. We actually uh, went, won a KDD competition on that our, uh, long ago, but if you Google um, KDD, Knowledge and Discovery and Databases, and do KDD Cup and search for PVA, Paralyzed Veterans Administration, that data has been out there for quite a while and many people use it for demos and, and learning and evaluation of algorithms. It would be smaller than what I showed. Perfect. Thank you so much, Wayne. And with that, folks, we are going to say a really big thank you to Wayne and Georgia today for giving a great presentation and for sharing all their knowledge and expertise with us. And we'd also like to say a very big thank you to SAS for sponsoring today's event and let you all know SAS is the leader in business analytics software and services and the market leader for advanced analytics. Through innovative solutions, SAS helps customers at more than 65,000 sites improve performance and deliver value by making better decisions faster. Since 1976, SAS has been giving customers around the world the power to know. During today's webinar, you learned how to extract insights, trends, and meaning from all the data in Hadoop using predictive analytics, machine learning, and recommendation systems. Thank you again, SAS. Folks, there's a polling question as you exit the event today. We'd really appreciate your feedback and take a moment and just click an answer and submit it. And also, we're going to push out a couple of URLs to you here that will open on your desktop in another window. So, SAS, we thank you so much. Wayne and Georgia, thank you. All of you that attended today, we thank you so much and appreciate you spending time with us. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.